Hi, so in this second video, I'm going to be showing you how to present the gospel from start to finish. I'm not going to be talking about how to introduce yourself at the door of a stranger or how to end the conversation, but purely how to use the verses that we went through in the first video to present the gospel. Now, there is just one thing that I want to bring to your attention. Um, you should already know by this stage what the, person you're, who, who, yeah, what the person you're speaking to believes in order to get to heaven. Okay, so for example, most people will say, well, you know, you've got to be a good person. You know, you, I'm a pretty good person. I think I deserve going to heaven. That's going to be the main um, response you get from someone about going to heaven. So I'm going to be using that example in this gospel presentation. So you already know they believe it's about being a good person. So if they've you know, given you the opportunity now to take out your Bible and show them your Bible verses that you've got, the first, well, actually, before I get there, look, the Bible I use is one of these waterproof Bibles. It's a New Testament, waterproof. I can fit it easily in one of my pockets. What's great about this, this Bible is that, you know, rain, hail or shine, I can pull this out and the pages aren't going to get destroyed. Um, you can also highlight the verses in this Bible that you use. Um, you need a dry highlighter. You can't use your regular highlighter because, because it's waterproof. It's not going to uh, retain the color. It's going to spread. Um, so a dry highlighter is basically a normal color pencil that's fl that has fluoro colors. Okay. So the first reference, remember, Romans 3.23. Uh, one more tip as well. I keep one of the gospel tracks into the first, where, where the first reference is. So I keep it there at Romans 3.23, just so it's a very quick thing for me to do. The tract is there and I'll just quickly open up so I'm not wasting time for that individual um, to get straight into the gospel. So Romans 3.23, I'll, I'll ask them, well, you know, let me show you what the Bible says about going to heaven. And if they've given me the permission, we go ahead. I'll read to, you, to them Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the question I would ask that individual is, do you know what it means to be a sinner? Sometimes they'll give me the right answer. It doesn't matter if they give you the right answer or the wrong answer. You know, I, I still tell them what it is. So I'll say, yes, sin is breaking God's laws. And then I'll say this, for example, lying um, is breaking God's law. Lying is a sin. The Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness. And um, I'll often, Ask them at that point, have you ever told a lie? Now, you know, 99 out of 100 people are going to say, yeah, you know, I've told a lie in my life, you know, and, I'll, and if, if they are kind of resistant to say that, I'll say to them, well, you know, I've told lies in my life. Have you told lies in your life? And then they'll usually open up and say, yeah, you know, I've at least told a lie. And you can show them. So we'll see the Bible says, for all have sinned. We're all sinners. Yourself, me, the whole world, everybody has broken God's laws. And then it says, and come short of the glory of God. So what you want to show them there is that God's glory is perfection. God is perfect and God is without sin. And because we're sinners, we've come short of God's glory. We can't make it to heaven on our own. And that they usually understand. If you are still struggling with someone admitting they're a sinner, just you can ask them, well, you basically say it this way. You can say, you know, nobody's perfect. And at that point, they'll recognize, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's a, it's a very prideful thing for someone to say, yeah, I'm perfect. Nobody says that. Everybody knows they have faults. So that's another way to say it. You know, if they're struggling to admit that they're a sinner, um, they'll be like, yeah, I'm not perfect. I've done wrong things. So then you take them to Romans 6.23. And uh, you say, well, see, because we're all sinners, God has a punishment for sin. And then you'll read Romans 6.23, the first part. For the wages of sin is death. Now, what you'll want to ask them at that point is, do you know what it means to have a wage? What it means, what, what the, that word wages means? And if they're, if they're struggling to answer, just say, well, you know, think about the workplace. Have you ever, you know, earned a paycheck? Have you ever earned a wage? That's your payment. And that's, they'll understand that. So then you'll, you might want to repeat that verse, for the wages or the payment of sin is death. Now, at this point, I explain to them the reason why there's death, pain and suffering in this world. It's not because God wants us to suffer and die. That's not God's original plan. But the reason why there's death, pain and suffering in this world is because mankind have sinned against God. We don't keep his laws and, you know, we just make this a terrible place for one another as sinners. 
And again, they'll usually nod to that and agree to that. Um, and the reason I bring that up now is because what's, what I have found many times people don't want to hear the gospel because they're angry at God. They say, well, if God is this perfect and just God, why does he allow you know, murderers? Why does he allow rapists? You know, why does he allow you know, children in Africa to die from hunger? And they'll use these kind of things uh, to resist the gospel. So I bring it up straight away. The reason why there's death in this world is because mankind have sinned against God. And again, they'll acknowledge that and then they can't turn around and say and blame God for the sin because they've already acknowledged that it is the sin of mankind that has brought the pain, death and suffering into this world. Now, the, the payment or the wages of sin here is death. And I'll usually say to them, um, so obviously when we die, you know, I'll ask them the question. You know, you want to make this interactive. You ask them the question, what happens to your body once you die? And they'll usually say it gets buried or it gets cremated or one of these things. And then I'll point to them and say, that's correct. You know, the Bible speaks of two deaths. There's a physical death, but then the Bible speaks of a spiritual death. And that's when I'll take them uh, to Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. And then I'll read this to them and, and it says here, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So they can see there's two deaths. There's the first death, which is the physical death, and there's a second death. And then I'll say to them, look, it says it's the lake of fire. Does that sound like heaven or hell to you? And, you know, they'll say, well, that sounds like hell. And I'll be correct. So that's, that's our, our punishment for being a sinner. Then I'll take immediately to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, where it has that list of sin, sins that send someone to hell. And I'll read it to them. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers. And at that point, I'll stop and say, you know, you, maybe you've never murdered anybody. And then it says, and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters. And I'll usually explain idolaters means someone that worships idols, okay? An idolater is someone that worships idols, but then I'll show them this, and all liars, all liars. So again, I'll just say, look, you may not have done these sins that are on this list, the murdering, the sorcery, the worshiping the idols, all these kind of things, but you've already admitted to me that you're a liar. And it says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And I'll usually ask them here, does that concern you? Does it concern you that the Bible says that the payment for sin is death? Okay. And even if they say yes or no, I, I, don't, I don't really make it. Uh, I don't really stop there and make that an issue. I just continue on with the gospel. Because what we're trying to do right now is just show them what the Bible says. I'm not trying to necessarily convince them right now. Okay. But at least they can acknowledge what the Bible says about these matters. Um, and then I'll say to them, look, this is all very gloomy news. I've come to give you the good news. I've come to give you the gospel. This is the bad news. And we need to understand what the bad news is before we can get onto the good news. And then I'll ask him this question. Do you believe God wants us to go to hell? Do you believe he wants us to go to the lake of fire? And again, most often they'll say, no, I don't believe that. And I'll say, that's right. You're correct. You know, you've probably heard that God is love. And they'll say, yes. And I'll, then I'll ask him, what do you believe God did so we don't have to go to hell. And look, because we live in Australia, because this is a you know, Christian nation as such, a lot of people are familiar with Jesus Christ. A lot of people are familiar with what he did, how he died on the cross. And every now and again, you're going to get the person that says, oh, he sent you know, himself or he sent Jesus to die on the cross uh, for our sins. They'll say something along those lines, or sometimes I'll just say, I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, it doesn't matter again what they say. You just want to have that dialogue. You want to get them thinking. Um, and then you'll, you'll turn to Romans 5.8, Romans 5.8, and show them that's right, you know, God loves us, Romans 5.8, but God commendeth his love toward us. And at that point, I'll just repeat that, you know, so God loves you. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if they gave me that answer, like Jesus Christ died on the cross, I'll just say, you know, yeah, that's what it says, you know, Jesus Christ died for us. You know, you're, you're, you seem to be aware of what Jesus Christ did. And I'll, I'll use that um, as kind of leverage because a lot of people know what Jesus Christ did. So that way, when they hear what I'm teaching them, it's not something that's totally foreign. They can see I'm trying to find that common ground with them. They know about Jesus. They know about dying on the cross. And I'm just pointing that to the scriptures and tying that all into the, to the gospel. In fact, that is the gospel, the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what I also show them from this verse, it says here, 
that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible doesn't say while we're trying to be good people, while we're trying to keep his commandments, he sent Jesus to die for us. No, I'll, I'll point them. Look, God looked down at us. He saw that we're sinners. We can't help but sin. And even then he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Now, at this point, I'll go into it a little bit further. I'll say to them, you know, God became a man. The word of God was manifest in the flesh, which was Jesus Christ. So he was fully God and fully man, the son of God. Again, don't usually nod at this point. Okay. And then I'll say to them, he lived a perfect life. He, he lived a life without sin. Unlike you and I, which have committed sins, Jesus Christ never committed any sin. And then I'll ask him again, um, and then what did, they did, what, what did they do to him? What did the Romans do to him? And again, usually they'll say, oh, they nailed him to the cross. They crucified him, something along those lines. If they, again, if they don't know, you just tell them. And I'll say, that's right. He was, he was um, crucified on the cross. And I'll ask him, why do you believe he was crucified on the cross? And again, they'll say, oh, because of our sins. But they, they don't really understand how that applies to them. And again, I'll, I'll always affirm that their correct answers um, so they don't feel like they're stupid and, and don't know what they're talking about. Of course, I'm going to affirm the correct answers. Um, and then I'll say to them, yes, he died on the cross for our sins. So all the sins you've committed in your body, all the sins you've ever committed, all the sins you've com you're going to commit in the future were put on Jesus Christ as though he committed those sins. And God's wrath, God's judgment, God's anger was put on Jesus Christ. He paid for our sins so we can go free. He paid for your sins. He paid for my sins. He paid for the sins of the whole world. And then I'll ask, do you remember how long he was buried for? And again, they might give the right answer. You know, he was buried for three days. And then I'll ask, well, then what happened after that? Uh, he rose again, you know, and I'll say, yeah, he, he rose again from the dead and then eventually went to heaven to be with uh, the father. Now, um, then I'll ask him this question. So they understand that Jesus has died and paid for their sins and paid for the sins of the whole world. Again, they may have already understood that concept. But then I'll ask him this question. So just because Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, does that mean everybody goes to heaven? And at that point, they're going to think about it. And usually they'll say, no, not, no. You know, some people still will go to hell. Not everybody goes to heaven. And then I'll say to them, Correct. There is one thing we must do to be sure of going to heaven. Okay. And again, at this point, they're probably still thinking, oh yeah, be a good person. Okay. At this point. So that's when I'll take them to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. So Acts 16, verse 30 says, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And I'll say to them, hey, that's a great question. You know, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved from my, my sins? What must I do, I do to be saved from hell? And, you know, depending on how interested they are, if I find that they're really keen and they're really interested in what I'm, I'm saying, I'll get them to read verse 31 on their own. I'll just, I'll just show them the Bible. Hey, read verse 31. Um, otherwise, I'll just read it myself. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And at that point, just to not, confuse them, I'll just say, look, thy house is your family. And basically it's saying here that if your family believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as well, they too will be saved. Okay. And they usually understand that. Now, I'll usually ask them this question now, um, especially if they've said you've got to be a good person to, to go to heaven. I'll say to them, look, does it say anywhere here that you have to be a good person to be saved? They'll say no. Does it say you have to go to church to be saved? They'll say no. You know, and again, depending on their religious background, let's say they're Roman Catholic. I might say something like, does it say you have to confess your sins to a priest to be saved? Does it say you need to be baptized to be saved? Um, and, you know, you can, you can come up with different things people say you need to do to be saved. And they'll say, no, no, no. And if sometimes they say yes, like I, I've had situations where I say, does it say you have to be a good person to be saved? And, I, and they've said yes. I'll say, well, let's just read that again. You know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. But at that point, anyway, once I've gone through that list, I'll say to them, well, what does the Bible say you have to do? And they'll say, believe on Jesus Christ. And they'll be like, correct, that's right. And then I'll take them to the most famous verse, John 3, 16. I'll say to them, look, let me show you the most famous verse in the whole Bible. Maybe you've already heard it. It says this, 
for God so loved the world. And I'll usually pause there. If I, if, if, I, I'll usually, if I haven't got their name by now, I'll usually ask them for their name. Let's say it's Robert. I'll say, you know, for God so loved the world, or we can say it this way, for God so loved Robert, that he gave his only begotten son. It's a gift. He gave his son, that's Jesus Christ. And then the most important part says this, that whosoever believeth in him sh uh, should not perish, that's not perish in hell, but have everlasting life. So again, you can see that it says it's just believing on Jesus Christ. Okay. And then I'll ask him this question. It says, and if you believe on him, you will have everlasting life. I ask him this question. How long is everlasting? And they'll just say it never ends or it lasts forever. And again, affirm that correct answer. If they don't know, just say, well, it's you know, it's, it's in the word itself, everlasting, it lasts forever, it'll never end, and they'll understand that, okay? Then I'll point them to verse 18, and I'll say to them, look, the Bible says not only, the, not, not, um, it, it tells us not only those that go to heaven, but also those that go to hell, and I'll show them John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. So I'll say, if you believe on Jesus, you're not condemned to hell. But he that believeth not, so the one that doesn't believe, is condemned already. So he's already condemned on his way to hell. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, so those that believe on Jesus are not condemned to hell. They're going to receive everlasting life. But those that believe not, those that reject Jesus as their Savior, uh, will be on their way to hell. But again, I'll, I'll show them this verse and I'll say, look, it says there, believe, believeth on him, believeth not, uh, believed in the name. And I'll show them, look, this verse has three times the belief because we want to reinforce to them, it's believing on Jesus Christ. It's their faith on Jesus Christ that saves them, nothing else. Okay, now at that point, you know, you take him to Romans 3.23, the second part of Romans 3.23. And usually at this point, I'll say to them, look, thanks so much for giving me your time. I'm almost finished. I've just got two more verses to get to. Um, just so they know, hey, you know, we're, we're wrapping up, especially if they're starting to get a bit fidgety and they might, you know, stop the conversation. I'll just, you know, reinforce, hey, look, we're close to the end now. <clears throat> Thank you for, for giving me the time. And uh, Romans 6.23, and I'll say to them, look, we've already read part of this. Uh, you may remember where it said, for the wages of sin is death. And I'll say, yeah. And I said, but I didn't read all of it. The rest of it says this, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, and I'll ask them, look, it says they're eternal life. That's just another way of saying everlasting life, something that never ends. And what I'll show uh, Usually, usually by, this, by this time they have one of these gospel tracts in their hand and I'll say to them, look, the Bible says eternal life is the gift of God. I've given you a gospel tract that's in your hand. How much did you have to pay for that? And they'll say, well, I didn't have to pay for it. It was free. And I'll say, that's right. You know, if you had to pay five cents for that, would that be a gift? And they'll say, no. I said, if you had to work for that, would that be a gift? And they'll say, no. And then I'll say to them, have you ever given a gift to, to anyone, like a birthday present? our Christmas present. And again, they'll say yes. And I'll say, well, who paid for the gift? Was it yourself or the person you gave it to? And I'll say, well, it was myself. And I'll say, correct. Gifts are free. If you had to either work for them, work for it or pay for it, it's no longer a gift. And they can understand that concept. So then I'll say to them, the Bible says here that eternal life is the gift of God. Okay. So then I'll ask him this question. If eternal life is the gift of God, who pays for the gift, you or God? And at that point, they've understood that gifts are paid by the giver. Um, and they'll say, well, it's God that pays for the gift. And I'll say, correct. How did he pay for the gift? The Bible's verse says he, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So when Jesus Christ was crucified, his death, burial and resurrection is how he paid for the gift of eternal life. And gifts are free. Okay, now um, at this point as well, I'll just reinforce, hey, eternal life is something that can never be lost. If you receive that free gift, but you could lose it tomorrow, was it ever eternal? Was it, did, it, did it last forever? And they'll say, no. I'll say, correct. Because when Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, he died for your past sins, your present sins, and even your future sins that you've yet committed. 
Now again, you know, people get a bit uncomfortable with that and I'll just say to them, look, obviously I'm not saying you should go ahead and commit sins in the future. You know, I'm not saying that at all. You know, we should strive to keep the laws of God. But the reality is we are human beings, we are sinners, and we will commit sins in the future. But you need to understand, even if you commit sins in the future, you can never lose your salvation because Christ has already paid for your future sins and you already have received eternal life. It's something that can never be lost. And that's very important for them to understand because if they think that they need to maintain good works, be a good person to keep their salvation, they're not trusting Jesus Christ alone. They've got their trust on their works. Okay. Now, at this point, I'll say to them, so uh, actually, no, I'll, I'll, yeah, I would say to them, I'll, now, now, at this point, I'll repeat the gospel through them one more time and I'll be very quick. I'll say to them, so do you admit that you're a sinner? And they'll say yes. And then I'll say these words, and these choice of words are very important. I'll say to them, according to the Bible, where do sinners go? And I don't ask them in your opinion or what do you believe I've told you, you know, because it, it, their opinion or, you know, them trusting my, what I'm saying isn't um, important. I want them to understand what the Bible says. And you'll find that a lot of people are resistant to thinking that God will ever send anybody to hell. Okay. They think, well, you know, maybe, you know, everyone makes it to heaven if everyone follows their light. You know, yes, I can believe on Jesus, but other people can believe on other things. And so I'll ask that question according to the Bible, because they've already seen it. They've already, they've already seen it in the scriptures, according to the Bible. And the authority comes from the word of God. Okay. According to the Bible, where do sinners go? And they'll say hell. And I'll say, well, does God want us to go to hell? And they'll say, no. I'll say, what did Jesus, what, sorry, what did God do? So we don't have to go to hell. And again, you know, they, they, they should say, you know, he sent, they, he sent Jesus to die on the cross. And sometimes they'll kind of forget and I'll just say to them, remember what Jesus Christ did? And they'll be like, oh yeah, he died on the cross for our sins. And then I'll say, yes, and after he died, how long was he dead for? Three days is the response. And then what happened after three days? He rose again from the dead. And I'll say the next question, just because Jesus died for the whole world, does that mean everybody goes to heaven? They'll say no. And then I'll ask this question, just like it's stated in Acts 16 verse 30, what must I do? So what must we do to be saved? And they'll say, believe. All right. If, if they've understood it, they'll say believe. Now, at any point of this, if they've struggled to um, answer the questions, just go back to those references and show them once again, just refresh their memory. Um, but if they say just believe and then I'll say, you know, do you have to be a good person to go to heaven? And I'll say no. You know, is it church attendance? They'll be like, no. Do you have to clean up your life and, and, and stop sinning? You know, they'll say no. Great. At that point, they've understood the gospel message. And then I'll ask this question. If you receive eternal life, if you place your, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you place your faith on him and receive eternal life, can you ever lose it? And again, they should say no. And at that point, I'll say, look, let me show you one more Bible verse. And that's where I'll take him to John chapter one, verse 12. John chapter one, verse 12. And I'll show them this and I'll say, see how We've, I've described eternal life as a gift of God. Well, just because someone's offering you a gift, you still need to receive that gift, okay? And that gift is received through faith. But look what it says here in John chapter one, verse 12. But as many as received him, so I tie that into the gift, receiving Jesus, receiving the gift, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I love this verse because it's, it ties into the receiving of the gift. And then it also mentions become the sons of God because a lot of people in this world think we're all children of God. We're all sons of God. And I'll show them, look, I'll show them this verse. No, that's a misconception. We're not all children of God. We're not all sons of God. We become sons of God when we receive Jesus Christ, um, when we receive that free gift through faith. So that's how you become a son of God. And then again, I might repeat that and say, look, if, if um, repeat that you can never lose your salvation, I'll say to them, look, when my sons were born into my family, they're always my children. Even if they rebel against their parents, even if they leave home, even if they want nothing to do with mom and dad, they're still my sons. And so when you're born into God's family, you are still his son, whether you're a good son, an obedient son, or whether you're a rebellious son. Hey, if you're a rebellious son, 
just like any parent would. He'll correct you, he'll chastise you, he'll discipline you to get you back um, on track. But then again, I'll reinforce the last bit, even to them that believe on his name. So again, just hey, it's believing on Jesus Christ, believing on his name, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'll ask him this question. Is there anything stopping you from receiving that gift right now? Okay. Um, and if hopefully at that point, they'll say uh, no. And, and then I'll ask this question. I'll say, do you believe what I've just shown you from the Bible? Because I, I want to make sure they firmly believe what I've shown them in the Bible. And at that point, you know, I'm hoping they'll say, yes, I believe that. Now, if they don't, if they say, no, I don't believe that, you know, you don't want to force them to say a prayer. You don't want to force them to receive the gift. Okay. Um, but again, I might just uh, persuade them a little bit more and say, look, this is this, you know, you may never hear this again. I'm going to go knock on the next doors. You know, you may never hear this again. This is your chance to receive the free gift. All it takes is for you to put your full faith and trust on Jesus Christ alone. And again, um, you know, I've, when I've done that a second time, I've had people say, yeah, actually, no, I do want to receive that free gift. So it's important to give them a second chance. But again, if they say, no, you know, I don't believe that, I'm not ready, I need to think about it, then don't force them, okay? Because they have to believe with all their heart, okay? It's not something, it's not just saying magic words. And then what I'll say to them is this. I'll say, well, if you want to receive the gift right now, how about we tell God this is what you believe and that you receive his free gift of salvation. And I say, look, we can just say a quick prayer. If you're not comfortable, I can lead you in a prayer. I can say a few words and you can repeat after me. And again, if everything's gone well, they'll want to do that. What I, what I personally find is about one in every four gospel presentations, one in four and one in five roughly of gospel presentations where I can give the gospel in full, they will want to go ahead and proceed and pray that prayer with me. And if they, they do want to pray that prayer, I always say these, this, this very important thing I'll say to them. I just want you to understand that it's not the prayer that saves you. It's not magic words that's, that saves you. It's, it's you believe in these things from your heart and trust in Jesus Christ. And at that point, they say, yes, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. So I'll lead them into prayer. And I'll say something like this. Dear Jesus, and then I'll pause and get them to repeat. If they don't repeat, I'll just stop and say, oh, you know, you can just repeat after me. And um, so, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, for being buried and rising again from the dead. For being buried and rising again from the dead. I'm only trusting you, Jesus. I'm only trusting you, Jesus. Please take me to heaven when I die and give me eternal life. Please take me to heaven when I die and give me eternal life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. And if they've prayed that prayer, boy, I'm rejoicing in the heart, you know. Um, uh, I'm trying not to be too awkward, but, you know, internally I'm rejoicing. And I'll say to them, look, you know, you truly meant that, didn't you? And, you know, they'll say yes. And I'll be like, well, according to the Bible, you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've become a child of God. You have eternal life right now. You can never lose it. And, hey, you know, welcome to the family. Congratulations. And, uh, you know, that's how you give the gospel as a beginner. Obviously, once you've developed your skills, once you've done this a few times, you might tailor it a little bit differently. You might use other verses. But just for the beginner right now, hey, I really encourage you, understand these verses and know how to present the gospel. Thank you so much.